Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. We're the Menchwarmers, your bi-weekly look at the world of Jews and sports. I'm Jamie. I'm with my friend and co-host Gabe. Gabe, how you doing, buddy? Hello, I'm doing pretty darn good. Uh, we're Do you feel better now that we've uh, started our golf season? Y- yeah, I think so. I've played once so far. I feel like I'm stretching out a little bit, um, just yeah. generally in life. Um, Definitely put a spring in my step. Uh, pun intended? Uh, yes, and um, <laughs> sure, why not? And also, I was sore the next day, yeah. which is always a, a good feeling. It was nice to iron out some of the mm. rust over the winter. <laughs> Would you like to play again? Hey, hey, hey. I'm going to putt my answer yes to you. Oh, uh, sorry. No, was... wait, wait. I had a ball. Uh, ah, there we go. Um, well... Gabe, I've got some I've got some big news for you in the world of Jews and sports. Big news in the world. People of... love Sandy Koufax. Yeah, that's the news. We we'd love. We're so excited to report the end of our Gudya, who was the greatest of all time diaspora Yiddish athlete. Um, we had thousands of people come and check out the bracket, um, yep. and and a whole lot of votes after fifteen exciting tournaments. Our number one overall seed uh, has won. That would be. Sanford, Sandy Koufax. Um, yeah. And, and just to go down the results a little bit, I think things went more or less chalk. I don't know if there were any huge surprises from where we were standing. Um, I was um, surprised by Sue Bird's elimination in the second round. I thought that's she would have gone a little further. Um, but she was up against Koufax. She was up so against Koufax. Was a and, and I think we yeah. can blame blame our producer, Michael, for improper seating on that one. Um, but it's it's it would have been close, although he did beat her, uh, you know, uh, Sandy Koufax did did win quite aggressively. I was also, yeah. you know, our, our it sort of ended as we talked about in a baseball versus swimming all semifinals. Um, right. So Koufax uh, was up against Mark Spitz in one semifinal, and uh, the other finalist Hank Greenberg was up against Dara Torres in the other semifinal. And uh, Koufax went on to to beat Greenberg in a in a you know sort of epic match of a pitcher versus hitter you know yes. who wins the day which is a good a good way to end it so but not the, a surprising result I would say ultimately what was interesting Koufax you know uh, wound up winning with over eighty percent of the votes in the final round um, yeah with, or over seventy five percent I think at least yes seventy five percent in the final final round something like that um, but it wasn't you know, necessarily the most lopsided race. Um, The closest race we had in the entire event uh, was our our first round battle between uh, Bill Goldberg and Barney Ross. uh, Yeah, good matchup of two two grapplers, two grappler fighters. Exactly. Yeah, two fighters. Two fighters. Um, And somehow, uh, and Goldberg pulled it off, actually, before getting absolutely creamed by uh, uh, Hank Greenberg in the semis, or in the quarterfinals. Um, one other sort of interesting comeback I found, or one other interesting uh, matchup, the first round, Mark Spitz versus Jason Lezak um, was our single most lopsided event, with Mark mm. Spitz winning uh, all over ninety percent of the votes in that one. He was our. our so I think that was a lot. It was a lot of fun. Vote. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I want to thank everyone who participated by voting. Um, and you know, going through all four rounds, there's a lot of uh, feedback we got on uh, different places where it was posted from people. And, you know, if anyone has old timey Jewish athletes, uh, especially Canadian ones that you want us to talk about, send us a message. We'll, we'll pull things from the mailbag and just, you know, rattle on for 15 minutes about, uh, some Jewish athlete from yesteryear that no one, that no one remembers anymore. That's, that's sort of the, you know, our goal with this podcast is just talking, talking about, uh, old timey Jews. Absolutely. Especially when it comes to, um, you know, I mean, even new timey Jews were happy to talk about. Right. So towards the end of the episode, uh, we have a very interesting interview with Brad Eisen of the Israel Baseball Academy. Uh, Gabe, unfortunately, you weren't able to join for that interview. Uh, so you can you could listen along to it with the rest of our uh, listeners. And Brad has started up a, you know, sort of baseball training site uh, weekend for Jewish high school aged baseball players. And the goal is to sort of be a training ground, be a development ground for the Israel national ba- baseball team. And, you know, th- that team's comprised mostly of Jewish Americans, um, increasingly some Israelis on the team, but, you know, it's Jewish Americans who have access to citizenship uh, via the right of return. And this is sort of the, you know, attempt to create a, you know, lower level uh, training area where they'll get hands-on development and sort of get into the system 
to potentially make it to the Israel national baseball team. So it was really interesting to talk to Brad and hear about what he's doing and what his plans are for the future with that. Uh, it It's fabulous. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to hear the interview. I'm, I know I wasn't there. I, uh, small emergency at home all as well, but I'm, I'm super excited to hear and hear about sort of what is the Israel baseball Academy, how it works and you know, uh, what this guy has to say for ourselves. So yeah, let's move on. Uh, any news in the Jewish sports world, Jamie, that you want to discuss before we get into sort of the, the meat of this post Passover episode? Uh, there is one that was, uh, something that we didn't, someone who we haven't talked about recently, um, or really at all. Uh, and that is tennis player Alejandro Davidovich Fokina, uh, who is Alejandro. recently was in, yeah, great name. Um, Spanish tennis player is recently in the news because he made it to the finals of the Monte Carlo open, uh, in the ATP. He is uh, half Jewish. Apparently his, uh, dad is a Jewish Russian and, uh, we're not entirely sure on the, on the veracity of that, but it seems to have been reported in different places. Davidovich seems to be a, a Russian Jewish surname. Uh, and so just, you know, one more Jewish tennis player to keep an eye on. There's really, it's boom times for Jewish tennis, tennis. And, uh, hopefully that's something we'll focus on this season as we get through the, uh, the rest of the Grand Slam circuit. It absolutely is extremely exciting. Um, at least yeah, I think he's a guy who's now, you know, he's now ranked, uh, you know, still in the two hundreds, but to be able to make it to a final of a, uh, or sorry, that was double. Sorry. He's ranked 27th now. So he has a very good singles ranking. Um, you know, along along with Schwartzman, Shapovalov, and uh, uh, Taylor Fritz, uh, there's a lot of guys with uh, some Jewish heritage who are, uh, you know, g- getting getting some run in during the clay season. Uh, oh, that's a- absolutely fantastic! Super exciting to hear. Yeah, any Jewish sports news you wanted to mention? Uh, yes, we we were given a tip sort of by our uh, uh, listener from across the pond, letting us know the story of Maccabi London Lions FC. So. London Lions FC were the Maccabi Club of London, an all-Jewish players uh, uh, team that operates in what is now somewhere in the ninth division of the British Soccer Pyramid. So if they win the next wow. nine leagues, they're in the Premier League. Um, okay. They play in something called the Combined Counties League, the ninth level of the English football league season, one of them. If they get uh, the winners get promoted to the Isthmian League, which sounds like something out of a Mitchell and Webb sketch. A lot of these teams actually sound like <laughs> something out of a, a Mitchell and, and Webb sketch. But the Maccabi London Lions, an all-Jewish team, have won the league. They won wow. the Combined Counties Football League and will be promoted to the 8th division of soccer uh, in, in Britain. And this is this is not, you know, it is it is for people with jobs, but it's not necessarily, uh, you know, your Sunday, your as they call it in England, they call it Sunday League, which is like, Sort of like a beer league that you and I okay. would play in somewhere in, in North America, but this is sort of uh, organized clubs that I will, see. you know, I guess, I guess the right, the similar way to be it would be like, you know, a serious men's league uh, that if they continue winning would eventually theoretically be in the Premier League if the Maccabi London Lions can do the unthinkable and spend the next eight seasons winning one <laughs> league after another. Um, it's a very, it's a very interesting thing, the way the British soccer system works, like it's, it, or football, I should say, um, it, it, it's sort of unique and I guess to other football leagues as well and, and some other European leagues where there's this promotion and relegation system where it's like, yeah, if you're just good enough, like, you know, you can, you can do it. You can make it all the way up to, uh, you know, you can make it all the way up to the big leagues. And, and I think, um, uh, when Leicester, when Leicester City did that, like a few years ago, hadn't they come up from like a few leagues down within a few years yeah. and, and really just made um, a run? They had, and it actually in Canada still works that way in curling. Um, to be oh, really? Team Canada in curling, you have to just win your like league night, then you win your local club championship, then you win your regional, then you win your you know provincial, and then you win the Briar. Um, wow! So you know. I, I, there aren't a lot of Jewish curlers out there, so this is a bit off topic. But if you know the Olympic team in Canada is just some local group that keeps winning, um, uh-huh. it's not an all-star team, uh, which is great. But the London Lions, congratulations to them. Welcome to the eighth division. Um, you know they beat out it seems to be fifty odd other teams in order to win this uh, league because um, there's a lot of other teams in this league. They beat out uh, if we're going back to the Mitchell and Webb sketch. Uh, names they beat out such teams as Frimley Green, uh, Bedfont and Feltham, 
uh, and the Ealing squad. Um, wow. So way to be very, very proud. Oh, not to mention Spellthorn and Engham, um, all of which sound so British, I couldn't have even possibly made it up myself. Um, so congratulations to, to the London Lions McCovey, and uh, good luck next year in Division 8. Yeah, good luck to them. Uh, something we should, you know, keep an eye on next year uh, when the season starts and, and see how they're doing. Hopefully, they can, you know, make it keep keep going up the ranks, and uh, maybe Tottenham will have a, a contender for the, for the team <laughs> yeah, that's capturing Jewish hearts. They are the next Tottenham. <laughs> maybe. Um, so, Gabe, a few things. One of the things I want to talk about um, is something that we talked about a few years ago for the first time, and it's sort of like a sequel episode to that. Um, now, that episode, I'll remind you. Uh, it was called A Synagogue is Where You Bless Up. Do you remember what that refers to? Yes, that was where Antonio Brown, who I guess is no yep. longer in the league, uh, bought yep. a house with a disgruntled, synagogue Disgruntled receiver. Disgruntled receiver say. Antonio Brown, and not a Jewish person, uh, bought a house in Miami that had a synagogue in it. Um, and that's where him and his friends went to bless up. Is that Did I, did said, I get yeah. that right? Yeah, that was, that was correct. And so this was uh, spurred in part by... Um, a photograph and, and news story that came out this week a little bit about uh, the recently departed uh, Montreal Canadiens legend Guy Lafleur, uh, who was photographed in a Tullus and Kipa back in 1981. And uh, uh, Alan Besner, who runs the CJN Daily podcast, uh, interviewed the photographer Robert Foxman and wrote an article as well discussing, you know, how this came to be. Um, you know, mm. he's pictured in a in a talus and a in a kippa holding a siddur as if he was praying. I, I, it was it was it was snapped uh, uh, at a restaurant, not at a synagogue. But you know, it's a cool photograph, and I think it was one that people saw it and they said, "Was Gila Fleur Jewish? Could someone <laughs> name Gila Fleur possibly have been Jewish?" The answer the answer is no. No, <laughs> he is not. But um, got us thinking about sort of other examples of non Jewish athletes doing doing Jewish things. Uh, an update for 2022. What what else has has gone on that we should talk about? So, uh, Gabe, anything you want to, to mention in that in that vein? I think it's always worth bringing up uh, Stephen Curry's or Stephen Curry, however you want to pronounce it, Wardell Curry Jr.'s uh, Hebrew tattoo. <laughs> um, right. He uh, he is you know not a Jewish person. Uh, doesn't speak a lot of. Uh, uh, I don't think he speaks a lot of Hebrew, but he has uh, Kavreshyud or Kavreshyud in uh in hebrew yeah. um which apparently so we talked about so we talked about stuff the first time around because he has some a bible verse on his yes that's what hebrew. it is that's the bible verse yeah um and then and it, there it was a story this past fails. right there was a story this past december that he had a new tattoo on his wrist uh of kuf kuf uh kuf Rashid, yes which is his name curry yeah. And there was a Jewish, uh, you know, theologian or the <laughs> theological student, a Talmudic scholar, Sam Shankoff, yeah, who said that the uh, the word in terms of the Hebrew Bible is a you know it's a fair transliteration of his last name. And we should say like you know obviously Hebrew newspapers have written about Steph Curry at various yes. times. Like his name has been transliterated, uh, you know, it's translated transliterated using using those letters. But it also has another meaning in some Talmudic uh, scholarship of an accidental omission, meaning some sort of uh, nighttime omission. I think we'll put it that way. And uh, people had a little bit of fun about that last time about how, you know, this is sort of not quite not quite getting the Chinese symbol he, for soup. He, he does shoot uh, from distance. Accidentally translated, you know. Yeah, and that's what people said. You know, he can shoot in his sleep. So it checks out. <laughs> um, and his brother Seth also uh, has the tattoo as well. And other family members do too. So, you know, not not the worst thing to have translated. Uh, a little bit funny to have that. You know, maybe the next tattoo, he'll include uh, some vowels as well. That'll, that'll you know, allow there to be no mistaking what the uh, meaning uh, maybe is. Maybe he's just a good enough Hebrew speaker that he can read trope. Like, it, you know, is written. Right. He, I would like to see, you know, these Hebrew tattoos seem a little amateur for me. I'd like to see a, a non-Jewish athlete get a Hebrew tattoo that's written with, like, Torah notation. Like, with right. those lines at the end of every letter so they can take the little finger and read the tattoo on their arm like that. I, uh, I definitely find the, the, the trans, sorry, the um, transliterated Hebrew tattooing a bit of an odd thing. Um, like I know I, Harry Styles has his like sister's name tattooed on his arm. Yes. And, so I uh, was going to bring that one up. Um, okay. He has, he has Gemma 
tra- uh, tattooed on his arm. Harry Styles does. Yeah, and it's like there isn't really a letter for J. No, it's I know Gemma. This is someone he has Gemma. Yeah, exactly. Tattooed on his like arm. there's the, you put the Gimel with the little thing on. Like I know this is someone who whose name begins with a J and doesn't have a Hebrew name. That it's like you know there is sort of a way to make that sound, but it's not. And it's just like it's just such a funny thing to do where it's like you're not this isn't even a real word you know it'd be one thing if you get like shalom tattooed on you or something like that right but, uh Gemma, yeah, Gemma I, I is the odd. lady version of your name i guess so yeah more or less or i the lady version is sort of a, an old way to say it it is the the uh uh yes the female way to say it which is feminization totally yeah um, similar that said so uh, it's 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 a bizarre one. Uh, Harry yeah. Styles has got a bizarre one, but I want you to tell me about one more player uh, that sure. we're talking about. You know, we've we found a whole bunch of different athletes who tend to do Jewish things. Um, who was Rafi Ortega? Right. So so Rafi Ortega is a sort of you know journeyman baseball player. Uh, he's current play, currently playing for the Chicago Cubs. He's had he's had a you know decent career. I think he's uh, maybe you know, 10 years in the league now, something like that. Uh, mostly left fielder uh, and, you know, has been sort of up and down player mm-hmm. most of his career. Uh, but it seems to be catching on this year with the Chicago Cubs. And people were sort of mystified the other day when he stepped up to the plate and a uh, remix of a uh, Haredi Orthodox recording artist song <laughs> called Thank You Hashem was playing in his uh, in his batting practice music. Um or sorry, that, his walk-up music. That was on his playlist, and, what he wanted the crowd to hear. Yeah, exactly. So, so sorry, for, we should say for people who don't know, when you're in Major League Baseball and, you, and you're hitting, you get to choose what your walk-up music is. Uh, you know, they'll play a certain song as you as you come up to bat. And that was the song that he chose. And people were sort of like, what? Why is this guy playing, you know, Thank You Hashem? Uh, is he Jewish? And, you know, I, I we should point out there was a, a good article written about this by uh, our friend Louis Keene. Uh, friend of the pod uh, mm-hmm. for forward, and he sort of did the deep digging that uh, I, I think everyone in all, all ten of us in the Jewish sports media did, uh, looking through uh, Rafi Ortega and his wife's uh, Instagram, <laughs> and the the answer seems to be they're messianic Jews. Right. Um, so they have the tra- some of the trappings of Judaism. Uh, they are you know having a Passover seder, and there's certain amount of uh, Torah scholarship, let's say, that goes on. While also embracing Jesus and lots of posts about uh, Jesus as well, and so Jesus coming. Back, I don't think appearing yeah, ready I don't to think, be. I don't think we we should be. Uh, let's not dive into the uh, the sticky subject of messianic <laughs> Judaism on our podcast, but it is a good answer to that, and I think an important one as well because I think a lot of people were confused about you know this Yosef uh, uh, Newcomb Payas wearing uh, Haredi rapper. Uh, song being used as the walk-up music. So yeah, I mean, uh, I think I think it's, it's something we can welcome. You know, there's there's yeah. parts of messianic Judaism that are happy and glad sure. to see it. Um, and that's them. Who do you think is the uh, Jew whose music is most been used in in walk-up music? Has to be Drake. Has to has be. to be Drake. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I, I would say Drake. I, I know Matt. Yeah, Matt Sorry, Chapman of the Jays. Uh, Matt Chapman of the Jays uses Drake. Uh, Alec Manoa does too when he comes out to pitch, and um, I think it's probably just like it's. He's probably at like five to ten percent of the league. For of, of, absolutely, at any given time. I also wonder, like, you know, I I don't know how much I think the band. I I don't remember the name of the band. Um, but there was a while where uh, Wilmer Flores was using the Friends theme song. Um, nice. And as his as his uh, walk up music, the band is called the Rembrandts. Uh, uh-huh. I know that the you know David Crane and Marta Kaufman, the creators of Friends, are Jewish, so that is definitely a a Jewish walk up song. Um, That's not bad. Yeah. The okay, uh, apparently the lead singer of uh, the Rembrandts is named Philip Solem, which I'm gonna guess is Jewish. Um, Who knows? But yes, I I I would say not so many have had Jewish. Uh, Drake's probably the most, but. You know, the Rembrandt's I'll Be There For You is, is a good backup for a Jewish uh, song. If we have any listeners who know that the Rembrandt's are or aren't Jewish, let us know. Uh, anyway, so I think that's a pretty pretty good update on uh, non-Jewish or Jewish-adjacent athletes doing Jewish or Jewish-adjacent things. Any, any other ones you want to there's mention, There's one game? more we found. Uh, Toronto okay. FC player Carlos Salcedo Jr. 
who is ah. very much not Jewish to the point where he has a cross and I think a picture of Jesus tattooed on his chest from Mexico, mm. played in Mexico, plays for the Mexican national team in Toronto FC, likes to tag his Instagram posts with a Star of David emoji. Um, as far as I can tell, based on my understanding of Spanish and his all of his Christmas posts, he doesn't know what it is. Uh, mm. But as far as I know, as far as I can tell, uh, he likes the image and continues to post it as sort of a symbol of maybe a powerful lattice work um, that represents right. his strength and the teamwork of Toronto FC. Two other, uh, I should say, closer to home ones, a, l- a little different than uh, and, than exactly what we were talking about. But Alec Manoa, uh, the pitcher for the Toronto Blue Jays, does wear a chamsa. Uh, um, as does Carlos Salcedo, as a matter of fact. Yeah, so the chamsa, not exclusively a Jewish uh, symbol. And I think, um, you know, most people have know that, but probably most of our listeners think of it as a Jewish symbol, uh, but not an exclusively Jewish one. So... Uh, that's, uh, you know, it not, I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm sure I've seen it and other people have seen it. David Ortiz used to wear a Hamsa. They've seen it and said, huh, that's, that's weird, you know, yeah. or what's going on with that. Um, and you know, nothing wrong with wearing it, obviously. And the other thing I want to mention is that the Blue Jays wear a, uh, home run jacket after they, uh, for the player who hits a homer, they come back into the dugout put on this and get jacket. a jacket put on and the jacket has cutouts and, and lettering from every country that's, uh, represented by the team, all the countries of the players. And uh, this year now it has all the countries of the coaches and staff as well, including Israel. So not sure exactly who on the Jays staff is from Israel, um, but that's something we should look into and find out why Israel made it onto the team. We absolutely should. Uh, Thanks for catching that. I wonder if Nate Fish has found himself a little uh, (laughs) interest a lot lot of, um, um, uh, you know, connection to the Toronto Blue Jays. It would be fascinating. I see that it is. Yeah, like, it's funny because it, the the team, you know, the the jersey was originally just like uh, the places where the or the jacket was originally just the places where the players are from, and now it's sporting, you know, the not exactly baseball hotspots of uh, Pakistan, you know, Spain, Argentina, uh, Ar- Ar- Argentina, yeah. And so you know, it's it's become France, so it's become more, uh, it's embracing more countries. It's a very cool thing that they're doing. And we'll continue to do, but and, and no Israeli baseball player on the Jays. As you know, strangely me. enough, there was—I mean, there was a Jewish player, Rowdy Telez, who left last year. Um, yeah, and there, sure. are, there are—I I don't think there are any Jewish players left on the Toronto Blue Jays. Um, but if they were, maybe they could explain the Israel connection to us. <laughs> That's something we'll have to look into uh, with the team. Speaking of Anyways, Israeli uh, baseball, why don't? Sorry. Speaking of Israeli baseball, giving you speaking an of Israeli to throw baseball, to your great interview. segue. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Let, let's go to our interview now with Br- Brad Eisen of uh, Israel Baseball Academy. From award-winning journalist Marsha Lederman comes Kiss the Red Stairs, a compelling memoir of Holocaust survival, intergenerational trauma, Divorce and discovery that will guide readers through several lifetimes of monumental change. Marsha was five when a simple question led to a horrifying answer. She asked her mother why she didn't have any grandparents. Her mother told her the truth. The Holocaust. Decades later, her parents dead and herself a mother to a young son, Marsha begins to wonder how much history has shaped her own life. Reeling in the wake of a divorce, she craves her parents' help. But in their absence, she is gripped by a need to understand the trauma they suffered, and she begins her own journey into the past to tell her family stories of loss and resilience. Kiss the Red Stairs, available now wherever books are sold. Hi, we're joined tonight by Brad Eisen of the Israel Baseball Academy. Brad, how are you doing? I'm doing well, James. Thanks for having me. It's a great day. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I'm sorry Gabe's not able to join us. Uh, He's got some infant troubles at home. Uh, But can you tell us a little bit about the Israel Baseball Academy? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, The Israel Baseball Academy was created out of a conversation that I had um, with national team personnel for the country of Israel. Uh, One of the questions that I had asked them was how they were fielding their team for the Olympics in 2021. And they told me that a lot of it was done via word of mouth or looking at rosters of college baseball players looking for Jewish last names. So I suggested to them, hey, why don't we 
formalize this process. And through that, we were able to come up with the Israel Baseball Academy, which is essentially the official scouting service for the national team for the country of Israel. Right. We had a uh, we had Jonathan Mayo on uh, a long time ago, who's a you know MLB writer and draft expert, and he was involved in the early days of, of Team Israel. And he said that uh, you know a lot of the the trying to find players in the first days was just going through roster lists and saying, ah, oh, this guy sounds like he has a Jewish last name, you know, <laughs> and, and that was basically it. And and finding Absolutely. out that finding out that uh, you know some people who didn't necessarily sound that Jewish, like Ty Kelly, uh, were Jewish, was like you know, a real boon uh, to get guys, guys without obvious Jewish sounding last names um, and get them onto the team. And there's a, there's a lot of great talent in the uh, baseball community that happens to be Jewish. And we determined that without something like this, we would, to your point, never be able to find a guy like a Ty Kelly. Uh, So we're excited about the opportunities that lay ahead of us and our ability to possibly use this tool to find some talent and maybe one day push them into a role for the, for the national team. And so what's on uh, what's on deck for the Israel Baseball Academy in terms of sort of getting that talent or encouraging it? What do you guys have lined up? So in order to do that, we have created a series of uh, programs, which we call Evaluation Weekends. And our goal is to host these across the country. Our first go round is here in Los Angeles, where I'm located in May, uh, May 14th and 15th. And the purpose of these programs is to invite Jewish baseball players between the ages of high school Uh, and possibly into college, and give them a chance to come go through a two-day workout with national team coaches and personnel and allow us to properly evaluate their abilities, start start to build a relationship with them, and begin laying the groundwork for uh, future baseball playing opportunities with the team. Right. And so uh, just going to the, the background a little bit, I, from what I understand, Israel Baseball Academy basically is you. Uh, you're the organization. I mean, obviously, you've got the national team behind you in terms of support and things like that. But how did you get involved with this? How did this, uh, how did this come to be? Do you have a background in baseball or sports? Uh, how did you get involved with you know, Team Israel or sort of trying to create their, uh, their, their recruitment process? I... I... I'm a sports guy. This is a type of program that, that would have spoken to me whenever I was uh, appropriately that age. I worked in front offices for the LA Clippers and the LA Galaxy for a decade plus on the okay. business and marketing side. So sports has always been deeply ingrained into my everyday life. Um, in recent years, I've been working for the Jewish Federation in Los Angeles and Again, through some conversations, I was able to come up with this idea and and piece together two of my passions, which is serving the Jewish community, building Jewish community, and uh, sports business, which I've always been fascinated by and I've I've always enjoyed my time working on. That's great. I mean, I think a lot of, um, certainly we've heard from a lot of our listeners and and, uh, our feeling as well is, you know, we ever, everyone got really interested in Israel baseball at the 2017 World Baseball Classic when it was like, you know, they qualified and then had that amazing run. Uh, you know, winning games when nobody thought they could win games. I, I assume it was sort of similar for you in terms of getting interested in, in Team Israel baseball itself. Absolutely. That was more or less whenever they first came onto my radar. And as as timing would have it, timing is everything, I guess. But uh, that was right whenever I'd started in this professional role for a Jewish nonprofit. So it was able to, to grab my interest pretty quickly. It helped me jump in and have some conversations with colleagues in a, uh, in a non-threatening and, and, and very casual way. And that's kind of what got my, my brain thinking, how can we subsidize this program and help it get better? And, and it would be awesome if we could continue to bring down medals and championships, but that's a long way down the, down the line. We got to find some players first. Right. I mean, you see the way that, uh, I guess European soccer teams are probably the best the best uh, analog for this. That it's like they they're not just uh, you know picking up free agents and things like that. They're training kids from like the age of ten and and recruiting them to their team and developing that. You know, I guess in baseball you have a farm system, but this is like an even younger era. Uh, and that's sort of how you generate successive uh, you know successive years of talent and uh, having people come out and play and things like that is just getting them when they're young <laughs> and keeping them interested. I, I take it that sort of the focus on is, is making sure that there's, you know, that continued connection between uh, these young Jewish baseball players and, you know, potentially playing for Team Israel. Absolutely. And uh, you nailed it with the European Soccer Academy model. That is basically how we modeled this idea uh, or this program. And I think that relationships go a long way regardless of what it is that you're doing and our thought process is very simple if we can 
begin building relationships with these athletes in an early age and begin uh, putting them in positions where they can be successful both in the interim and in the long term, I think that it will pay, pay itself forward for everybody involved. And then the icing on the cake is that because these guys are committed to playing baseball at such a high level and because their time is very much slanted towards their baseball playing schedule, um, we are able to bring them together and create a cohort and, and build some relationships in the Jewish community that they might otherwise not be getting on the travel ball circuit. Right. And so uh, tell us a little bit about the first event that's coming up this, uh, this May. So the first event, as I alluded to earlier in the conversation, is May 14th and 15th at Cal State Northridge. It is open to high school classes uh, 2022, which is graduating seniors this year, through 2025, which is uh, the freshman class. The program is two days. It's It runs Saturday and Sunday. We are built to accommodate Shomer Shabbos uh, athletes because we obviously want them to, to take sure. advantage of their day of rest. But over the two-day period you will get a chance to go through some individual showcasing, uh, positional drills. Uh, we will record all the appropriate metrics, bat velocity, uh, 40 or 60 yard dash, um, hand velocity, et cetera, throwing velocity. And then on day two, we'll put them in some live game situations and allow them to scrimmage and, and take an additional showcase batting practice. And uh, we'll package it all up nicely in some highlight reels and we'll provide everybody with some feedback and we'll ask them to uh, – to continue to come back the next year so we can continue to grow and develop their their abilities. And, and do you have a sense of how many people are going to be able to come out for this uh, initial event? We are anticipating somewhere between 40 and 60 athletes, which is awesome. That's great. And wow. uh, especially for, for an inaugural event, um, we want any any baseball player who, who is interested in pursuing this opportunity, uh, interested in playing high-level baseball, we want them to come out and participate. So we will take as many as we can get and uh and registration is still widely available that's great and i take it uh future future events would be i I take it in uh jewish centric cities or new york and chicago and and miami maybe things like things things of that nature no no uh no israel baseball academy uh games in salt lake city (laughs) yeah but uh but maybe we can put it somewhere close to salt lake city where those kids can travel uh you nailed it we we are trying to get into the the large metropolitan regions that have big jewish populations I mean, Toronto has a professional baseball team. I'm sure there's a handful of guys up there that would be interested as well. So we'll we'll put that on the radar Absolutely. and maybe we'll even get to Canada. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a, a really interesting idea because, you know, so much of it is just the identifying and the making that connection. Because I think, you know, before Team Israel baseball really existed, like no Jewish player was thinking, uh, you know, how do I represent Israel nationally? Like, you know, there has to be that uh, impetus to do it. But now that it does exist, and I think if you're a Jewish baseball fan, it's something that you've been aware of, at least on the periphery and probably more directly in the last several years. And I think it's sort of like it, it's so great to have a, a collection point for it and for people to have that connection because uh, they're going to want to continue to be involved in baseball. You know, for people who go on to play in college or, or minor league or professional baseball, uh, you know, they can be a huge asset to the team. And, and you know, there's there's a World Baseball Classic next year. There There's probably not going to be any more Olympic baseball, it seems, but the World Baseball Classic should be back every three or four years. And, you know, I think there's there's an opportunity for Israel to really field some competitive teams in the next in the next decade or so. I agree with you. Uh, We definitely are anticipating a World Baseball Classic in the upcoming season. I hope there's Olympic baseball in the future. Uh, But nevertheless, we are are certain that there will be plenty of international competitions down the down the road. And to your point, uh, the sooner we can get a guy into our program and start to build that relationship, the better chance they have of eventually being able to be fielded and, and selected for national team service. Right. Um, one, one additional I think thing it goes I'd both like ways. Because, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say one, one additional thing I wanted to touch base on is is the, the long-term goal, the long-term dream, like I just alluded to, is to be able to get guys onto the national team. Um, it's a very competitive, very competitive uh, roster, there's limited spots, and there's a lot of great talent across this country. So we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But in the interim, we also want to serve these kids uh, and their baseball playing interests in the near future. So we're, we're also going to hopefully put them in venues where we can get additional college scouts and college recruiters in front of them so they can continue to showcase and, and potentially expand uh, their baseball playing careers post high school. And then we, to a point you made earlier, we have a ton of connections across 
professional baseball, whether it be the minors or the majors, whether it be current players, whether it be coaches, whether it be uh, business operations or, or baseball operations. So we think that through our resources, we can put kids in some really great venues to be seen and to showcase and to expand their baseball playing opportunities, both internationally and at next levels here. Right. I think there's a sort of virtuous cir- circle that can go on for those things where, you know, you've seen guys like uh, like Ryan LaVarno is probably a good example of, of someone who, you know, has been a sort of fringe major league or minor league player who I think has showcased his talent at the international level. And, you know, I, I'm not saying it's it's the reason why he's gotten a job or something like that, but it's helped with his profile, I think, for there to be, you know, more talk about him or, you know, seeing him play against, uh, you know, solid competition at the WBC and things like that. It, 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 you know, it helps everybody. And same thing for these younger kids who are trying to get uh, looked at by, by college teams, that uh, it's good to have those connections. And, and, and it's also, you know, who you know is important as well. And having those connections in the game is, is always going to be useful too. Absolutely. So are there members of Team Israel who are going to be out at the, uh, at the inaugural event in May? Yeah, so our, our event in May, the workout is being led by the head coach of the national team, Nate Fish. Nate Fish, yeah. Uh, Nate's former, been... former, former guest on the pod, great guy. Oh yeah, shout out Nate, friend of the pod. Uh, <laughs> Nate King, is... King of Jewish baseball. <laughs> He certainly is. He he's he's quite the character, and I'm excited to work with him. Um, he is going to lead the two day program, and I oh, know that great. he'll put guys he'll put guys in a real competitive venue to ensure that they uh, that they get maximum a maximum experience from from coming out. Uh, we also have Zach Pinpraise, who was an infielder on the 2021 Olympic team. Sure, um, he's a SoCal native. Uh, and he'll be helping us out. And then we have a handful of, adi- of other uh, baseball guys, as I like to call them, who are coaches at the coaches or, or private trainers at the junior college or the, or the Division three level. And they'll also be helping us run this program. But our, our two main guys who are connected to the national team, uh, Pin Praise and Fish, we're excited to work with them. They're excited to be a part of it. And down the road, we hope to fold in even more players from the national team and give them a chance to share their story and uh, show these guys that they too are living examples of opportunities down the road. That's great. Uh, that's great. Really great uh, interview. Great talking to you, Brad. Uh, really glad you could join us. Really wish you the best of luck with the Israel Baseball Academy. We'll be sure to put all the links in the uh, show page so that everyone can find it. Uh, if any of our listeners are high school aged uh, baseball playing kids in the SoCal area, this is your opportunity. Yeah. Go go yeah. go! Be involved with the Israel Baseball Academy. And if you're if you're anywhere else in the country, just know <laughs> that we will be there as soon as we possibly can and keep us on your radar. Uh, we look forward to it, James. I appreciate you having me on, and this is a great podcast. And I look forward to hopping back on in the future. And thank you for giving me the time. Thanks so much, Brad. What a fascinating interview with Brad Eisen, and what a cool project! I'm excited to see yeah. how how their you know big weekend goes, and and I was enjoyed listening to that interview, and it's going to be exciting to see them expand, and I hope they get the chance to, and I'm glad we were able to be a part of it. Yeah, I mean, we'll definitely keep an eye out if there's something going on in Canada uh, that would be great to be involved with, and uh, definitely promote to all our listeners, and uh, any you know if you know any young baseball players. This could be a great opportunity for them to uh, continue to develop their skills and, you know, potentially get involved with uh, Team Israel Baseball. If you're in the L.A. area, um, reach out to Brad. Yeah, we'll have all the information about that in our show notes. Um, and we'll also have a link to uh, the CJN Daily's podcast about the Gila Floor photograph that we talked about <laughs> earlier. Um <laughs> If you, if you want As to find always, Harry Styles' Hebrew tattoo, you can just pretty much go on the internet. That seems to be pretty much all over it to find his yeah, Gemma right. tattoo. Yeah. Uh, so thanks again to Brad for joining us. Um, we should say before we go, uh, you know, please like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to it. Uh, you can find us online always at uh, the CJN ca where all our articles and podcasts are published yep. and you can find us on twitter at uh, mentors tell your friends about our show and our twitter um we really love putting the show out for you guys and we hope we love continuing to do it so uh spread the love for the mentormers and uh, we'll be back in a couple of weeks thanks bye, bye.